Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. This episode's brought to you by Federal Premium Ammunition. You know, I've been shooting Federal for a lot of years, guys, and I can't say enough good things about them. Everything from the TSS Black Cloud loads to the Blue Box Steel and now the heavy bismuth loads that they have, and of course the traditional tried and true Black Cloud FS steel, they got a load for everything. Last year I had a chance to put some of the new stuff through the paces, and I cannot speak highly enough about it. It swats birds out of the sky, gives me awesome patterns, and with the new heavy bismuth, I can use some of my old shotguns in the field as well and not have to sacrifice performance. So guys, when you reach for shells this year, reach for Federal Premium. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Wingmen Podcast. And as you can see, my illustrious guest with me today is Mr. Ike Eastman. Ike is the leader behind everything that we do here at Wingmen and the Eastman's brand. And we were fortunate enough to share some blind time last year. And it's in our latest YouTube video. Is that where we're, the blind leading the blind? Or it is was that different? Some, it was something like that. <laughs> Deaf, dumb, and but we won't get into that. <laughs> we took our kids... Out last out on that hunt. It was a New Year's it was Eve Day or Day? I can't it was Eve Day. Eve Day. Because we day. all went partied yep, after, yep. after Yeah. And but our kids were chomping at the bit. Your kids were chomping at the bit to get in the blind. My kids are in the blind a lot and they, they love it. And it was the perfect opportunity. The weather was fairly mild. Yep. And we had lots and lots of birds. And it was just one of those deals where we thought, you know what, let's all let's take the kids down and we'll just have a good time. And I want to kind of rehash that day a little bit, what it means to you as a dad to do stuff like that with your kids. You have two daughters, as I have two daughters and a little boy, and the importance of getting kids engaged at a young age, why we do it, how the best ways to do it might be. Um, I don't have any questions necessarily that came across for this because we're doing this to kind of Go hand in glove with the video. Yeah. So first off, I just want to congratulate you or thank you, uh, more importantly. Uh, you know, you you took the time to save that blind, to save that setup uh, until the birds were there, until there was a lot of birds, and so that it's, you know, it was going to be a successful hunt. One of the, you know, every, every child has, has their own first few experiences in hunting, and uh, my first experience was was pretty brutal just because of the the situation and it, and you try and so you try and stack the deck to make sure that that experience is well the weather was good like mm -hmm. you mentioned we had tons of birds like you mentioned right. we had the right film crew we had the right dogs we had the right opportunity to give them a couple you know 3 4 hour experience um, that that makes them want to come back because just recently I asked, I said, you guys want to do that again? And it was beyond yes, please. Yeah. It yeah. My kids very are very excited. Yeah. My, and mine are the same way, you know, and I think my early hunting experience were similar probably to yours in a lot of ways. It was, you know, a lot of sit here, be quiet. I'll be back kind of well, thing. The gear just sucked. Oh, they didn't man. make stuff for kids. Well, and, and to be fair, we didn't, I wasn't ever hunting ducks and waterfowl in conditions like we hunt in out here because the seasons back there were different. Yeah. Earlier versus late. But man, some of the big games, some of the deer hunts, I mean, it was 30 degrees below zero when I shot my first whitetail. Brutal. I don't, I don't Brutal. know why you would do that. Well, you just came back from, from Alberta <laughs> sitting <laughs> hunting exactly like I hunted growing up, and it's not fun. It's a middle game. It is 100% oh, a middle not, game. It's not fun. It's not fun. And we didn't have electronics. We had books yeah. back then. But that's a whole other discussion for a different time. But, yeah, the, the, I think we might have spoiled those kids a little bit on that hunt because it was pretty epic. Yeah. As you can see in the video, we had a ridiculous number of birds. So much so that you'll hear me say on the video, we're not going to shoot. We're just going to enjoy the show because that's part of – that's part of saving a spot. Right. You know, if you have the luxury of a lease, if you have the luxury of, of a secret, like a honey hole that nobody else has access to, maybe it's a piece of private or a hard to get to piece of public. If you shoot it out, it's not going to be any different than if a bunch of other people were in there banging right. on it. But if you meter out the hunting to you're only doing it maybe once a week, 
You're staying away from the from the roost in this case, where that blind happens to be upstream from a big roost, and we just tread real lightly on it, and we don't shoot into big groups of birds. Where we in the video, we just shot single birds that decoyed. Right. So I have a question. This one comes from Ike Eastman, big fan. <laughs> Uh, how do you judge if you've uh, if how do you uh, how do you uh, I guess gauge if you're shooting it out or if, or if you can put more pressure on it is is there a way is there an easy way there to is do that? there is and it's just and it, it's about bird behavior you know if you go down there you can you can hunt a spot multiple times a week as long as you're not usually hunting it back to back to back you'll notice the first time you might you go it might just be lousy with birds like it was the day we took our kids yeah birds everywhere. The next time you go, maybe you go the very next day, and there'll still be a ton of birds. If you go again a third day in a row, you're going to notice a decline, a drop off. You might not; it might not be a decline in total numbers of birds, but birds that want to actually work into your spot because they get wary of it. You know, they get they realize that when we fly over there, there's shooting that takes place. Yeah. There's a lot. Last time we flew over here, Bob was with us. Yeah, remember Bob's remember not Bob? with us anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What about Bob? <laughs> And uh, that's the easiest way is to just judge bird behavior. And when you start seeing birds that don't want to decoy to your place or they don't, they ignore your calls, you're hunting it too much. Give it a rest. Yeah, give it a rest. Give it a few days, a week, sometimes two. Maybe a weather change. Right. And, I, and I'm obviously, we're, I'm talking to the guys that, that have, again, have the luxury of, of being able to rest spots. You know, there's the weekend warrior guys out there that, and I, and I was one of them for a long, long time and still am in, to a large extent. But you're trying to hunt heavily pressured public birds on ground that everybody else can hunt. Some of these guys are hunting refuge systems with draws. Yeah. So you don't even know what you're going to get. You're just going out to hunt. That's totally different. Right. If you have the ability to manage your birds, man, do it sparingly. And I think the proof was in the pudding last year. We literally never shot a bird that wasn't in the decoys yep yeah you would make us no 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 just just yep. wait just wait yep. okay take that one yep. i mean it was very selective on purpose and it was a lot of fun and now of course there's a a couple birds that came by that <laughs> shoot that widget yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> stuff like there's that. always yeah and that, that spot's unique in the fact that it's mostly mallards yep. down there I'd say 99% mallards. So when you do get a, a a big Drake widgeon that comes loafing by on the river, not decoying, he's going to get shot. Yeah. At, you know, <laughs> no it's matter like, what's happening. Yeah, exactly. Cause that's like, that's a special bird and it, and it's a bonus bird. You know, it's not all about shooting limits, but, um, it's nice to be able to take home six birds a piece of full limit. You can shoot your five mallards and you get one other duck of some kind. And it can be hard to do in that yeah. particular place. Well, it's good for kids too. Cause they, you know, they see mallards and they're playing with mallards. You right. see in this, this video, you know, the kids are, 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 they're exploring is all that is. It, some people are like, why would you teach your kid or why would you let your kid do that? They're just exploring. Right. They're exploring what b blood looks like. They're right. exploring what the beak feels like, what mm -hmm. the you know feathers feel like. They're exploring is all they're doing. You, know, you don't let them mutilate them, obviously, but no, you let them explore. No, there's a respect. Yes. And, and I teach that. We're emphatic about that with um, with all of our, all three of our kids. With this is there's a respect for that animal. I don't care whether it's a bird, an yeah. elk, a deer, an antelope. Yep. Um, you know, my wife shot a really good antelope buck this year, and the kids were there. They were on the hunt. And my little boy's excited and he's three and he's climbing on it and he starts like, like hitting it. And my wife took him by the hand and said, no, Jed, we don't hit, you know, you don't hit the animal. You can pet the animal and you can pat it and everything, but we're respectful of this. We, you know, we've taken yeah. a life here and it deserves respect. Yeah. And you're absolutely right because you should have fun. That's what waterfall hunting and bird hunting is. It, all hunting should be fun. Right. There's different types of fun. There's type yeah. one fun, type two fun. Well, I was just talking to a guy the other day. He was talking about hunting and how much fun. And he's like, one of my goals is to backpack out a, a bison. A bison. I'm like, what? why would you do that? <laughs> that's type two fun. That's 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 that's, that's insane. Or or you haven't been around it enough. Or, I uh, yeah. That's a, that's a whew, no thanks. I, when we had that conversation, I got I was thinking about that. And I thought, yeah, it's doable, but holy smokes. You, you it better right, be cold. You, exactly. You're going to lose all your meat unless yeah. it's cold. And yeah. you, I'd want to be able to have a sled. Yeah, that's right. You know, just sled pieces out. 
This episode of the Wingman Podcast is brought to you by Leupold Optics. You know, guys, obviously there's a handful of things that I rely upon heavily for wingmen. One being performance eyewear, and Leupold has crushed that category. I thought I knew what good perf- eyewear was, what good sunglasses were. Man, I was wrong. Performance eyewear from Leupold has taken that to the next level for me. Another thing is binoculars. I have to have high-quality binoculars for scouting, for finding birds, and Leupold's bring me all of the qualities that I need in a pair of binoculars. They also make killer everything, as you guys know. So check out Leupold, and thank you for listening to today's podcast. Back to the birds. That that day in particular, you know, we were super selective. But what is, when your girls talk about that, what do they remember from that day? So obviously they they remember, you know, the number of birds. Um, they talk about the dogs working mm-hmm. and, and jumping in the water when it's cold because they're out cold. You know, they're outside and they're cold or it's cold and they're, you know, got all of their ski ski equipment covered up with as, as much camo as Crip-tech. we could find. Yeah, I look back at that and I'm like, I need to get a couple of little Cryptek coats because <laughs> your girls are wearing, are going to have a nice smallest adult size coat they can find yep. over their stuff and mine are just wearing like yeah olive drab ski jackets right you know? right but you know you know so they 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 talk about the dogs working in the cold and how excited and different those dogs are mm-hmm. where they're you know they're at work they're you know yeah. and i and I, I i walk them through when that dog's doing that it's like you being in school it's fun for them. It is an absolute blast. That's what they live for. Now they like playing fetch in the backyard and they like, you know, getting petted and messing right. around and all that stuff. But they are really excited about that. So they talk about that. Um, one of the interesting things, and and we've joked about this a couple of times, but I never looked at it through a child's lens. Um, my 13-year-old, who she was 12, she she was barely too too young to hunt last year. I've convinced her this year when we go, she's going to shoot. If we can get a renegade and a twelve gauge or, or a twenty gauge or something like that, I keep asking Savage to make us a tw- make us a twenty <laughs> gauge. I but, think they probably will eventually. But I, I think she, I think she'll be fine. She's thirteen and she's not a petite little girl. Um, but she's excited about that. But what what she said is, she goes, "I just like how um, versus big game hunting, how you get to sit and talk." Mm-hmm. And everybody's joking and cutting up and laughing. You know, you're drinking coffee. They're drinking hot co- or hot chocolate. You're eating snacks. In fact, there's a funny thing. <laughs> we do we do the old Juniper Mountain coffee break in the middle of, of in between uh, birds. And my youngest, who has braces on at the time, um, Todd is the perfect dad because he knows snacks are important. I mean, look at Todd. He he knows yeah, snacks I- are important. <laughs> <laughs> But this ain't all puffy vests, folks. <laughs> yeah, so he brings snacks for the girls, and he, he the the dogs get Snickers, and the girls got what were they? Uh, I had oatmeal cream pies that yes. day. The little Debbies, you know that's that's the best part of hunting in general. It should be fun, you know, because like get back to our what we talked about. It was I remember some pretty miserable hunts when I was a kid. Yeah. And we, I didn't have a lot of snacks, yeah. and, you know, and I think you could take it too far where if that's the, all the kid wants is snacks, snacks, snacks. That's a problem. Then, they're, then they've lost the focus, but it should be fun. And when things get a little slow or they start to get a little cold, man, a, a little Debbie snack or a Snickers mm-hmm. or some hot chocolate or a donut or something yep. like that, it just, it adds to the fun, Yep, you know, and, and yeah, your youngest with those braces. <laughs> you handing out little Debbies. Of course, they're frozen by this time. They are handing out little Debbies. Solid. And she didn't think about it. She opens it up and goes to eat it. And I'm watching this whole thing going, this is going to be interesting. And so she wraps it back up and probably stuffs it in a pocket. She right? couldn't eat it. No, she, she couldn't, couldn't eat it. And she stuffs she, it back in a pocket. And, and then things are happening. And 20 minutes later, Todd finds a little Debbie on the bottom of the blind. With a bite taken out yeah, of it. Yeah, with like a <laughs> rip taken out of it. And he's kind of starts to throw a fit. He's like, who did this? Starts to blame his own kids, actually. He's like, who I've... took a bite out of it? And then didn't eat it and threw it on the floor. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I go, Timber. My youngest name is Timber. I go, Timber, is that yours? She goes, yeah. And she's looking at Todd going, he's going to eat me. And, and I said, you couldn't eat that because your braces, huh? She goes, no, it was frozen. <laughs> He ripped the braces and I right felt off. bad immediately. <laughs> it's one of those things where you step in it, you know, insert foot into mouth yeah. immediately because 
Father of the year right there. Oh, oh, and I mean, like you haven't done it. You know, <laughs> oh, we've, we've all done it. Yeah. Husband of the year, father of the year. I mean, we could sit here and just tell stories, the whole podcast about times when we were jerks, you know. <laughs> but the funny thing about that is that's one of the stories that we remember. And she remembers that from that oh, yeah. day. We laugh about it. Because she says she doesn't have her braces on now. Right. She's in a break. She goes, Dad, this year I won't have my braces so she, I can eat a little Debbie. She told me that the other day. <laughs> I picked. I was picking the kids up from school, and she came out before my kids came out, and she goes, "I got my braces off. I can eat little Debbie's now in the duck blind." <laughs> and I laughed. I thought, you know, that's and that's what it's about. And that that added to the ridiculous numbers of birds. Yeah, that made a super memorable hunt. Yeah. And I hope I hope you get to see that on the video. Hope that comes through. That we had fun. That was a good time. It was kind of it was lighthearted. Yep. Because there's times, you know. Big game guys are the worst at this, myself included. It's like opportunities on on these tags that we draw are limited. Yep. And so there's a there's a stakes level to it. On you get a good deer tag, and man, the pressure just you can feel that. And if you let it, it'll ruin your hunt. Yep. And we have a tendency to look at bird hunts where like, oh, it's just a screw around time. There's still a level of where you want it to be successful, and if you're not if you're not working hard at it, if you're not doing the right things, you're not going to experience that success, yeah. and it's frustrating. Yeah. But you can sit in the blind and drink Juniper Mountain coffee. You can yeah. sit there and eat Little Debbie's. You yeah. can, it's a social event. Your brother Guy, I think, probably one of the best lines ever. He said, <laughs> this we he this one and only bird hunt. And I, we've talked with about his this daughter. before. With it, he took this his isn't daughter. the first time we've done no, this with kids. No, and that's... That's an important thing that I'll get back to. But he said, you know, this isn't hunting. This is a coffee club with shotguns. <laughs> and he's not hes not 100% wrong. You know, there's the, the hardcore bird guys are going to be like, no, it's serious. You know, and it is. And it's, and it, it we can be. Yes. And we, and we put a lot of time and a lot of effort into it. I think about just the physical blood, sweat, and tears that I've put into rebuilding both of our blinds this year. Yeah. Because the river destroyed, we had really high water. Yeah. Anyway, it can be serious, but it you should be enjoying it at yep. the same time, and making sure that your kids see that we're here to do something. We're not out here just to screw around and have fun, but we're going to have fun in the process. It's the whole work play balance. Yeah. You know, and I think that hunting teaches that, no matter whether it's a, a duck hunt in January like that or a pronghorn hunt or a deer hunt yeah. because you take your girls you take your mm -hmm. family pronghorn on pronghorn hunts in the fall as do i yep in fact we got another question uh charlie eastman <laughs> uh long time listener i came prepared yeah long long time listener uh first time <laughs> first caller. time caller uh how do you get your kids involved in the outdoors well that's funny you that you asked that charlie because um that was actually one of the questions on my list just because i don't have it written on my hand <laughs> doesn't mean i don't have questions in my brain <laughs> The how do you get your kids involved? You take them in early. Yeah. There is never too early. Well, there's never too early. No, your wife was oh dude was nursing a child the first time that kid was on a hunt. She literally my son and it, a hunt. We were hunting a white white tail yeah, box out of the pickup out of the pickup, but we were hunting. Yeah, yeah, and it's one of those deals where it's like it just worked best to hunt that particular spot. By sitting in the truck and waiting. Anyway, yeah, she's nursing my son. Buck comes out, and I'm like, I think you might want to shoot this buck. And she's like, looking through the binoculars. Here, <laughs> hands me the kid, gets out, boom, smokes the <laughs> smokes the buck. And we got pictures of her, you know, with the kid, not her, breastfeeding with the buck. And, you know, that got awkward a for graphic, a second. But anyway, early. There's, yeah. there's no such thing as too early. One of the biggest regrets I have is, um, the last time my wife had an elk tag, which is a long, a, you know, not a limited quota tag in the state of right. Wyoming, JC was, my oldest was like one. Yeah. She was little, little. And I had this spot all figured out how we were going to hunt it, and we couldn't get, it was homecoming. I was I was school teacher and coach at the time, and I had to announce the homecoming football game that afternoon. And I said, I'm going to go out and hunt in the morning. So yep. I was going to hunt a fairly accessible spot in a place that you and I both have hunted mm -hmm. together. Grace has a tag. I have a tag. 
we got this one year old and this is one of the biggest regrets that I've ever that I've ever had we couldn't find a babysitter and Grace stayed home with JC I went out that morning and I called in a respectable six point bowl to within 30 yards of well, this my first archery. glassing spot this was rifle oh okay this was opening day of rifle season okay and I I pulled up to this spot, got off to glass, and this bull bugled right below me. And I cow called to him, and he went, he ran right up to the. I was sitting on a high point on the road with a four, with a four wheeler, and he ran right up to me. And I'm thinking there is no reason that my wife couldn't be here with our one year old, and she could have shot that bull right here. Yeah, with a one year old, with a with a kid right there. Yeah. And it's like okay, there's there's stuff involved with all that, but the point is. We could have pulled it off. Yeah. We could have done it. Don't use the excuse of, well, I've got to do this, or I've got to do that, or, oh, I'm afraid the kid's going to get cold, or oh, if they get bored, yeah. so take them. <clears throat> there's a, not a lot of photos in, in my brother's office, my brother Guy's office, but one of the photos that is in there that I know he holds <laughs> to highest regard is um, when he was probably three or four, my dad drew a moose tag. And my dad shot a moose and hits the photo of him and my dad on that moose hunt and my brother sitting on the moose. We and put that in the 200th issue. Yep, that's right. I mean, it's it's one of those photos you go, I wish I had that. I know. And so back to uh, it, it's never too early. But what what if what if that time has passed, right? So I, I got this asked to me um, by Onyx. I went to Onyx, uh, one of their employee get togethers and they put us on stage and asked us barraged us with questions and, and one of the guys asked said listen my my 11 uh, year old's never been on a hunt how do I get him there I said number one watch expectations know that you're not on a hunt with your buddy with your hunting right. buddy you're on a hunt right. with a kid get them dressed properly bring the snacks mm -hmm. make sure they're they're hydrated Make sure that, that you're not walking them into the dirt. But not hydrated to the point where, Daddy, I got to pee, pee every 30 right. seconds. Right. But make sure that they have water if it's a, if it's a yes. big game hunt. Yes. And, and understand, 500 yards to a kid is a long ways. You're not going to go two miles. Yeah. That ain't, that's, right. un, that's unachievable. You'll ruin it. Make sure they have their own little pack. Make sure they have binoculars, even if it's a cheap Tasco pair. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Something that makes them feel included in it. Yep. Um, and... And when they ask a question, no matter what's happening, even if it ruins a stock, ruins a, a, an opportunity, answer the question and work through it because you, that's their first experience. It's their first impression. As we always say, I know it sounds redundant, but first impressions are important. Yeah. And that's their first impression of being in the field. And make it fun, make it enjoyable so that they want to come back. Because what's going to happen is they're going to, they will progress, and they'll progress way faster than you think they will. Mm -hmm. They'll go from, huh, that was kind of fun, <clears throat> to, hey, I want to try this. And then pretty soon, you know, that 11-year-old kid's 15 – and he's packing half of your stuff, and yeah. he's you are going that five miles, and yes. now you've created a hunting buddy. Now that's, you've created something correct. that you're going to do the rest of your life, and you're away from the freaking screen, and you're you know f word that, uh, and you're and you're actually getting time with your kids that you'll never get any other time. Right. The best conversations I've had with my children are in the field. Hundred yep. percent. Yep, absolutely. They're candid. Yep. They're, there's questions that pop up about all different kinds of stuff. Yep. They're yep. dealing with, on successful hunts especially, they're dealing with, literally with life and death. Yeah. They're looking at, they're watching an animal die. They're figuring out what that looks like. Yep. They're looking at this. They're, they're, it just opens them up to so much experience and opportunity that, you get one good shot at. Yep. Now, if you botch it, you can tr you can do it again. That's that's the best thing about bird hunting in general yes. is there's usually going to be multiple opportunity. Yep. And if something happens, it's like okay, we have a teachable moment here where we can talk about what we need to do differently next time. Mm -hmm. But it's not the one opportunity we're ever yep. going to have either. Yep. Yeah, Willie Willie Robertson, who you guys know from Duck Commander, um, Duck Dynasty, Buck Commander. 
Um, he, he's, he was actually on my podcast on East, Eastern hunting journal podcast, which is, it's an epic conversation. You can imagine those guys have a hell of a story, Oh man! but he said it beautifully. He said, in order to date his daughter, you have to go hunting with him. And I, I, I went, wait, what? He said, because I want you to understand that I'm a heck of a shot. I also want, <laughs> I also, first and foremost, I also want you to understand or to be able to see you in an uncomfortable situation, in a, an excited situation, right. in a frustrated situation, in a situation where you're mad because something didn't go right. I get to see all the different emotions of that person in a snapshot in one day on a hunt. Right. And that you will, you will know your kids better than you ever thought you did. And you'll know that potential suitor better than, than you could do any other time. That's a really interesting point that you, that you bring up about that snapshot. You, you get to see that gamut of emotions. JC shot her first grouse this year. First time that she shot an animal. Yep. And she was responsible for the death. hundred percent. And I, I kind of walked her through it because the night before she had a little bit of trepidation where she, was a little unsure. Big words, Johnny. What's trepidation mean? <laughs> I'm horrible at she this. She was a little unsure about the whole thing. We practiced. We shot. She's a good shot. It was like, this isn't going to... Mm-hmm. The actual hitting of the bird isn't going to be the problem. I said, you're, if, it's, if, if, if you do it right, you're probably going to be a little nervous. You're going to be a little excited. You're going to be really excited when you, when you kill the bird. And then you're probably going to be a little sad. Mm-hmm. after the fact and, and people some people think oh it's just a grouse but it's a first mm-hmm. it is a first first impression exactly and i got to watch that entire range of emotion that she went through from she missed the first couple it was a kind of a rush situation you know and she missed two and she said i think it's okay daddy because i had a dream last night that i that i missed the first two and i killed the third one that's exactly what she did wow you know, whatever. Oh boy! But I got to see her when she when she shot the bird. You know, it's flopping around, and her her my middle child, her younger sister Ennis, is like just the dog, just boom. She's <laughs> on that bird. Like I'm like, go get it, JC. And Ennis is like out of the truck on the bird. You know, she went and got the bird, and it was interesting to see because you could see she was excited about it, but kind of like reserved and like soaking it in, like. What's going on? And she was really jabbery for about five minutes afterwards. And then she got quiet. And we're driving around, and I, and I said, what are you thinking? And that was exactly what happened. It was that flush of emotion where the adrenaline spikes, mm-hmm. and then after a few minutes, whoa, that mm-hmm. adrenaline crashes. And she got to experience that, and she got to realize the responsibility that she has at when she decides to hunt. <clears throat> and it just brought kind of some new emotion into the whole experience for her. So this year, she's like, Dad, I want to shoot a duck. I said, okay. And I got them all signed up. That's a beautiful thing about Wyoming Yeah, is we have a hunter, hunting, hunter mentor program. I got them all signed up for the hunter mentor program. And I would encourage you guys, check into that. Um, most states now have very, really loosened up on hunting age restrictions or limitations. My niece in Iowa just shot a, her first white-tailed deer, and it was a nice little buck, and she's seven. Yeah. And it was like, seven? I'm like, holy smokes. But she was ready, and they went and did it. Yep. There's lots of opportunity out there to get kids involved, but don't push them at the same time. If they're not ready they're not ready to handle a firearm if they're not ready to handle that those emotions good take it slow yep take it slow <clears throat> yeah you know to your point disclaimer be the judge of that be the judge of your, of your kids and and mentor them through that but if you can get those kids addicted to that stuff before they're <clears throat> you know before they're interested in screens before they're interested in the sports. opposite sex before sports becomes mm-hmm. a huge thing um, get them interested in that. They'll come back. The beauty of it, I've seen it over and over and over again. When their life gets busy, it's okay. And then they get in their 20s and they're like, man, I, I really want to go hunting again. Or they find a spouse that likes hunting. Or 
they, you know, that, that's all they can think about. My godson's this way that all he can think about is fly fishing. I mean, he is, he's, he's going he to college rabid, for soccer. Dude. He's playing on, you know, college <laughs> collegiate soccer, but he is, I think he chose that school because it's got a really good trout stream. That, that is a hundred percent what he told me. <laughs> he goes, there's three within 45 minutes, three good fishing, yep. uh, fishing rivers within school. right there. Yeah. I was like, you realize you're gone in the fall. That's yeah. the soccer season. He's That's like, so not funny. every day, not every day. Oh I got gosh. breaks between class. Yeah. And but I'm, I was guilty of that I scheduled my entire post, my entire graduate degree the, as long as I could for first couple of years of it around like hunt in the morning, hunt in the evening yeah. type deal. Yeah. Anyway. But, but you could get them con- connected to it. They may not be rapidly addicted to it, but when they're, when all that life slows down, they'll come back to it and, and they'll remember that some of the life lessons that they've used to make them successful were, were learned, you know, in the duck blind right. or, or in the tree stand or, you know, in the truck hunting pronghorn. Absolutely. It's interesting you say that too, because I have a, I have a good friend whose son is a young man now out killing it and dragging it home every day for a you know, young family, you know, mm-hmm. and there was a time, I think there was a time there in self and admittedly so for the, for my friend where they kind of drifted apart mm-hmm. as father and son. And the last two years, the son has, it's, it's hunting in general, most specifically duck hunting that's brought them back together. The son's like, Hey, I want to come down and hunt this weekend. Yeah. Or I want to come do this this weekend. And their relationship now, because of that common bond of waterfowl hunting is stronger than it's ever been. So you're spot on when you say, if it's done right, if it's, if, if you create a love for it, it's, it creates a link and a bond that just deepens your relationship with your kids that nothing else. I don't think anything else can do it. I, I really don't. I, you know, I look at maybe farming or ranching. There's some connections there where you're, where you're working close to the earth and you're doing hard things yeah. that there, but again, it's kind of connected to the same. It could be, it could be anything though. It could be golf. It could be whatever yeah, you're into yeah. is it just get them out there and get them doing it. Well, I have a friend that uh, is, he's significantly older than me. His kids are closer to my age than, than he and I are. But uh, he said this perfectly. Uh, he said, kids go through when they, when they start to be teenagers, they go into a black tunnel. And they spend a fair amount of their teenage years in this in this black tunnel. And he said, your wife and yours job is just to be a light every so often to make sure that they're going through the tunnel the right direction. And then they hit their 20s and they come back out and they're they're adults and they become f- more friends than, ch- you know, child <laughs> mentor. I said, oh my gosh, that's unbelievable. And there he goes, there's nothing you can do. Every kid does it. Every kid goes into the tunnel and, and, and hopefully you can, you know, spend enough time with them to be a a shining light to make sure they're moving in the right direction. That's really interesting because, you know, to use that, to use that metaphor, you want to be that light and not a train coming at them, you know, because or the world's influences. Oh my god. Well, that's that's the metaphorical train. Right. You know, absolutely. They get run over on the tracks of life really easily. Mm-hmm. And having those bonds, creating those bonds, taking the time when they're little, when they're young to get them out, get them duck hunting, get them yes. pheasant hunting, do those things. Yeah, it's just so important. Well, bird hunting, you know the beauty of 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 wing shooting is you have blind time you have you know you have uh, pheasants or upland that you get to do that is very similar you know it's not it's not super strenuous so young kids can do it then you have turkey hunting which is a, is you know a, a game changer in the sense of having to be quiet and and much, no movement much more and, like big game yes right, yeah right. and so it's kind of a progression or you can do all of that in the same in the same world and kids can be involved in it and you know it's it's in my opinion, a lot easier to get somebody, a kid addicted to duck or to wing shooting than it is big game because it's a one and done. I think so. I think so. You know, the, the process of big game is, it's just higher stakes. You know, there's more practice, there's more everything. It can be very, especially in Wyoming, in the Western States, it can be incredibly physical Yeah, and it can wear a kid out, you know, but wing shooting has that ability, you know, you talk about upland hunting and yeah, you're going to walk a really long ways. But so you temper that with a kid. You want to go. So you got you're in South Dakota listening to this. You got phenomenal pheasant hunting. 
take your kid out on a walk, walk a piece of cover that's not terribly demanding. Yeah. If you get a bird, great. If not, you're still out there spending that time. You know, those, I think about those things that the things where I want my kids to go and I, and how I want to get them there. And it's all deliberate. You know, yeah. it's all thinking it through, thinking about, okay, I want to do this this weekend and my kids are asking to do this. I'm going to take this time to do it with my kids. Yeah. Um, you know, and we, I know there's a pile of people on here listening, going, well, that's great, but I don't have kids. So, you know, whatever that gets me into this question, how important is it? And I want an honest answer. How important is it to bring hunters in new hunters into the fold? And is there such a thing as too much hunting recruitment? Okay. So I'll answer both with a one word and then I'll explain it. There is, there is no max to that. Why, why would there be number one? Number two, yes, it is unbelievably important to mentor and it doesn't have to be your kids. It could be nieces and nephews. It could be the neighbor kid. It could be best friend's kid. Um, it could be whatever, just get involved in, in there's actually uh, organizations around now that are, that are pairing up, uh, good, strong men to kids that, that need that fathers in the field comes uh, to mind. Yeah. 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 John does a wonderful job with that thing. Mm-hmm. Fathers in the field where they pair guys up with, um, you know, with young, with young kids and, and walk them through hunting and, uh, you know, it, and it's interesting to me because it, we're we're both in our forties and our life is busy, right? Yep. We have kids and work and you know, Stuff. We, yeah, we try and get out there and, and do the things that we enjoy. Um, you know, I try and snowmobile as much as I can. I, I did once last year. Mm-hmm. It's just the world we live in. But if you don't have kids, that's one less thing. So go go find some you know neighbor kids or fathers in the field. And and if you're retired or your life's a little slower. It doesn't have to be your kid. It could mm-hmm. be the new, next generation. So that's, you know, now the, I had this question asked, which is, I think, what you're headed for. Is there too much recruitment? It, it, am I creating? And I, can, and I can qualify that a little bit. Am I creating my own competition there you on, go. on, in, you know, in good places to set up a duck blind or in, you know, places that allow you to, to wing shoot or turkey or whatever? Absolutely not. Because those kids, if you bring them along with you, they're the ones that are going to be taking you along when you're too old to do it by yourself. Or the next generation and I, there. We ha- I have places that we used to hunt here um, that I no longer hunt. A couple of them are voluntary because I know there's a father and son that it's like, okay, this is this is their pl- this is their spot to hunt. Right, you guys can have it. Yep. I don't I don't need to be down there. I have other places I can go. There's other places. And I had this conversation at the time where we're going, dude, these kids are about three or four years off from driving and doing this stuff. And sure enough, that's theirs now. Yeah. And that's cool because we taught, we showed them the ropes. Um, Nick Kafkis, uh, who used to run Western Waterfallers out here in the early days of Wigman, we did a ton of stuff with Nick. And we took some local kids, landowners, kids hunting yep. with us a lot knowing full well that we're when they come of age we're, we're probably yeah we're, this is gonna be it that was okay yeah because now i'm watching those those young men and they're out there all the time they're rabid outdoorsmen they love it well guess what they're gonna be dads someday they're gonna be older someday and they're gonna be passing that down yeah and it's that connectedness that generation and where i was going with that question or it's kind of multifaceted means it's got multiple parts. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. I got a third grade reading level. You know that, right? <laughs> anyway, there's a there's a very jaded segment of hunting out there right now that exists and it's like, oh hey, we've done too we've done too good of a job. Uh, we've over recruited. We don't need more hunters. We need the right kind of people. We need the right kind of hunters. And we look at what happened with, with COVID over the last couple of years. There's a lot of people that came into hunting and gun ownership. And I say, awesome. I think that's great. There's, but when you go in the woods, when you go in the field, 
there's more demand, there's more competition, and it is getting more difficult to find good hunting, to find good spots, especially on public land. Yeah. Have we have we over recruited? Have we done that? I say no. Because I look I'm looking at it as a long game thing, looking at it as the future. Yep. I agree 100%. The, you have to understand that this is an ebbs and flows. So, there if you, you have a huge uh, influx of hunters, that's you know, the number of hunters go up, what happens is the the um the resource starts to go down because those hunters are dumping resources into conservation, but they're not immediate. Does right. that make sense? It doesn't. It's not. I a bought a license immediate today. Turnaround. Right. That money isn't actually going to get used until twelve months from now. Right. And it's not going to. It's not going to be. Uh, it's not going to benefit that resource, be it ducks or geese or fought, um, upland or turkeys. It's not going to be seen. The benefits of that money is not going to be seen for two or three years or more. Yeah. And so you're going to see the ebbs and flows of it. Do this. Um, you can't have enough. And and here's what I'm going to get on a little bit of a rant. Here's what that's really what I was. That's what I was me. hoping. I know. For. That's I know. what I was. You were baiting for. me. I get it. <laughs> but I, 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 it just floors me when you have an, an a when you have when you're sitting around turkey dinner, and we're coming up on Christmas. You're sitting around Christmas, and you're around your family members, and there's going to be that crazy sister in law that doesn't understand why you hunt. They don't get it, right? Here's the thing to remember to tell them. Conservation for wildlife in North America, the North American conservation um, model, is only the, it, it is only funded by the sportsmen. Right. That's it. You say, well, animals for whatever. I'm a, you can name a million of Center them. Center for Biological Diversity. Whatever the, that is. The, the Humane Society of the United States. Yeah, I'm going to dump money in there because they're helping conservation. No, they're not. They are 100% do not. What, they do, what that money goes for is marketing and lawyers be, for lobbyists. That's it. Never do they put money on the ground. Never do they to give. Fight, th that, that money goes, their money goes to fight hunting. Yes. So they're actually fighting conservation. Yes. They're not. They're not the ones that are dumping money into uh, the migrate. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go big game just because that's it. my. That's my no, wheelhouse. They're not putting money into the migration initiative to figure out where these deer are migrating and then going. Okay, this is where the pinch points are and buying chunks of property or putting overpasses over in over interstates or or busy highways so that those deer don't get smacked. 150 of them every winter, whatever that number is. They're not putting money into that. You know who's putting money into that? You guys, when you buy a box of shells, or when you buy a shotgun, or when you do anything, you know who puts, you know who really gets screwed when on you this buy whole a license. Deal? Yeah, when you buy a license, you know who really gets screwed on all of this? The guy that that has a handgun or an AR that never uses it for wildlife, he's just plinking steel with it because he's paying the same amount of money mm -hmm. as you and I are, and that money is going to wildlife and he's never utilizing it, which. Yeah, keep going. Thank God they do that. Absolutely. Because the majority of the money that comes through the Pittman Robertson is from those guys because there's way more of them. They're, Absolutely. They, you know, you and I will go shoot a box of shells in a duck blind like we did on this hunt. Those guys will shoot 100, 150 yeah. shells. Right. Plink yeah. and steel. Yep, absolutely. And it's it was set up that way. Recreational shooting was has always been part of part of the pie. And it was set up that way because you got to have, you know, you need weapons to hunt. Yeah. And so at our, just, at our net, just an easier line. Yeah, absolutely. At our net. And I had a wonderful conversation about this a while back talking about sage grouse and the film and, and the project that we just, that we completed earlier this year. That's getting ready to show yes. here very, very soon. Yes. And one of the things we talked about was he makes, he makes his students, his biology students, because he teaches college classes for, uh, game management and biology, he makes them buy a hunting license so they can understand, even if you're not going to use it, you're still supporting conservation. You're part of it. You're part of it yeah. where you're not supporting conservation at all by supporting these other groups. And I, I think, I think that most of the folks listening to this podcast understand that they right. get it, but you made an awesome point with the fact that not everybody in your family does. And we're all getting ready to be in very dynamic situations over the holidays. <laughs> That's an Christmas. I saw a meme yesterday. I had to laugh. There was, <laughs> you know, the kids' table at th at Thanksgiving. 
And this one was like, we have a Democrat table. <laughs> and it was over there. And I, I, I'm not... I'm not going to get into politics too much, but I, I thought that was pretty funny, you know, and it, it was obviously very tongue in cheek, but it was Did back to my kids, little socialists. No. <laughs> <laughs> back to the point of you need to be, you, we all should be prepared to have those conversations at Christmas. I was flying home from Texas two weeks ago and got seated next to a very nice lady from uh, Montana. And we started talking, and what, what were you doing? And she was down doing philanthropic work in uh, Phoenix. So we got talking, what were you doing? And I'm telling her I was, on a, I was on a writer's hunt and this and that. And that led into the opening in the conversation about being able to explain conservation funding and the mm-hmm. North American model of wildlife management. Mm-hmm. And she was like, huh, I never knew that. I didn't. Th- this is a lady whose husband is a hunter. You know, they're small town, Montana. He hunts. She was familiar with what the Eastman's brand because he's he watches it and mm-hmm. different things. But she didn't she, it was out of her wheelhouse, so she didn't know. Yeah. So we have we have an opportunity and we have an obligation to and I'm not talking about beating people over yeah, I'm not the talking head with it. Yeah, don't be don't hey, be Uncle, going to Hey Aunt Sal well, it could be <laughs> Uncle Sally in today's <laughs> world. Hey. <laughs> oh great. <laughs> But hey, Aunt, Sa- for hey that Aunt one. Sally, this is, you know, you're not beating people over the head with it because you're, you're we're not going to, that doesn't any do so any good. You can't push a rope. No, you but can't. You, you what go. you can do, but what, what you just did on that plane is you can give a little, plant, co- plant a couple seeds, and then pretty soon they're over there on their cell phone Googling North American wildlife conservation and how it works and know that you're not you're not full of it. And then maybe they, you know. Maybe at breakfast they ask you a couple more questions, right. and and right. and honestly, guys, this the reason I say that is because this this isn't going to get we're not going to lose to the other the opposition because the opposition under will ever understand. You're never going to get them to understand. Where we're going to win is that middle of the road, right. that lady that doesn't know. Right. This episode of the We Men Podcast is brought to you by Cryptech. Guys, I'm super stoked to be partnering with Cryptech, and I love the fact that I share the same ideals with them. I love the fact this company is veteran-owned, American hunter patriots. It's awesome. I also love the fact that they make top-notch hunting gear, and they offer it in killer camel patterns that are going to keep you concealed across a huge range of environments and conditions. So guys, if you're looking for more gear, get out there and check out Cryptech. That's right. that's where the majority of the votes. That's yep. where the majority of of the power in in North America is, is that middle road that doesn't know that never were never really around it. Not saying they're against it. Not saying they're for it. They just haven't thought about. it. They don't it. really have an opinion because it's not something that's in their everyday life. Right. You know, pretty soon, I'm showing her pictures of my kids out hunting and my mm-hmm. wife, and she's like, "Oh, that's really cool." And she saw the connection, yeah. bracket it back to family and taking yeah. your kids hunting. She saw the importance of that connection yeah. that, you know, and that's what that is to us. And that's how we continue to build and push and go forward. Uh, I'm in complete agreement with you was I don't think there's, I don't think there's too much. No, I, I don't. You know, I look at the very thinly veiled agendas at aimed at ending all hunting, you know, and, and I hate to say it, but the old saying, the old story about, you know, first it was the, first it was the trappers, and I don't trap, so I didn't care. You know, then it was the guys hunting lions or bears with hounds, and I'm not a hound guy. I'm not like, so I don't care. I didn't care. I didn't say anything. Right. And then it was, you know, and it goes on down the line to pretty soon. Now you can't hunt them at all. You can't hunt them at all. And then so what's happening in Colorado? They're trying to they're trying to pass a law that doesn't allow that don't allow. You can't hunt trophy species for whatever reason. A long time ago, we put in in our game regulations that uh, mountain lions are a trophy species. Right. Whatever that means, I don't know, but they're trying to outlaw trophy species right. as it's as it's in because they're, that's lo- they're it's, looking it's, for a toehold. Yeah, that's what they're looking for: yeah. something to cling to and get a hold of, and then they'll take more and more and more. And I was talking, man, I've, I used to think this was a conspiracy theory, but I don't anymore. With the whole, with all the the big predator inter- reintroductions, the protections on um, birds of prey, mm-hmm. we'll talk about. We'll talk. We'll go back and, and look 
very candidly at at one time did we need to protect birds of prey eagles hawks owls yeah because we we'd gone too far the other way right. right now it's gotten to a point where holy smokes you go to any any managed place for bird hunting and there are birds of prey all over the place yeah and it they have a massive impact on game numbers i used to think that that was just okay it was a correction and I think it was initially where we can't shoot eagles, we can't do these things, we can't shoot hawks anymore like they do in Europe. Right. Now I think that there's a more nefarious agenda to it, where whether it's birds of prey, apex apex predators like grizzlies or wolves or mountain lions or whatever it might be, we're seeing inter- reintroduction efforts, we're seeing protection efforts. Um, even though the science, here's the thing that just irks me. Even though the science says these need to be managed, right. or you're going right. to, you're going to significantly affect whatever uh, their prey is. Yep. For instance, elk in, in Idaho. I know I talk a lot of big game on I'm on a wingman. That's podcast, okay. But That's I, okay but because we we could. It, it, well, it's well, all hey, applicable. You know what? Let's talk about birds, ravens. Ravens yes. are a huge predator That's I was for going. eggs. That's where I was going, and they. Are no one wants to talk about how their their impact on on sage grouse, for instance. Mm-hmm. For example, I'm sure they That's do just it with one every, bird, yeah, the yeah, impact. I'm sure they do it with pheasants and and All turkeys, any ground All nesting, right? All of them. They're a huge impact, but nobody wants to talk about that because they're protected and they have no way of managing them. And that's the agenda is to keep those birds of prey or those uh, apex predators on those lists, even though the science says otherwise, mm-hmm. which is means they're means that we're managing wildlife for our emotions, not for the science, which is wrong. Predators of any ilk have become the golden calf. Yes. And what I mean by that is they are they become the golden calf. They are an idol at which the foot of at which people worship. Yeah. To the point where we can't manage them, we can't do anything. And again, at one point in time, they needed protection. They yeah. needed those things. They don't anymore. And we should be re-examining our game management laws when it comes to predation, when it comes to ravens, when it comes to birds of prey. Maybe we need to do some management with these things. I say I'm all for that. Biggest reason is I see this deification of these predators, no matter whether they're avian or m- mammalian predators, I used to be like, oh, they're just doing this, you know, whatever they think, you know, whatever. There, It's a thinly veiled ploy to end hunting, yes. to end regulated hunting, yes. which is the number one tool for game management and conservation funding in North America. Yep. Worldwide, actually, if you think about it, if you look at it. You don't. You take the hunting away. What's the next thing? Well, if you're not going to hunt, you really don't need those guns. And pretty soon, and I am here to tell you, I was. I used to think that was a conspiracy theory. I don't anymore. No, I I agree. I I am here to tell you taking that that is a that is a slow progression. And I was recently in a socialist socialistic country that it, that I thought was so, socialistic. It is now communism, and we were in a situation where. Um, a truck got stole and then there was a high speed chase. And then there was concerns that these people were going to retaliate on us and we had nothing. I didn't have bear spray. I didn't have a pistol. I had nothing. I had a rifle that was required to, well, if you weren't in your hunting spot, you were required to unload it and put it in a soft case away from you. I have nothing. So what do you depend on? Nothing. It is the scariest thing. I have never been in that suit. I have, but not in the, in a situation where I'm making a battle plan on what's right. going to happen if we come around the corner and we get ambushed. Yeah, by one the, of those by these your, hooligans. Your, yeah, your situation was very unique in in the fact that you'd had a truck stolen. Yep. And there were people looking for you guys, mm-hmm. and it, it wasn't just like oh, you know, I'm going to the grocery store and I don't have my concealed my concealed weapon on my, my handgun with me. So I'm no. feeling, I'm feeling a little vulnerable. It wasn't that at all. There was a real, there was real a real and threat. present danger. Yeah. To there you. was a, there was a real threat. And the only reason that it didn't happen is because of us is because um, we were smart and we moved areas. So they were looking for us in the wrong spot because they're not woodsmen. So they don't understand that, but it's scary. I am here to tell you 
that second amendment is so important to you and I's everyday safety. Right. That's what creates safety in the U S it's not because you have to use it. It's because you have it. It's because you have it. Yep. And that's the, the way potential. It, to that's use the it. way it was designed. Man, this is turning into a political podcast. We went from hunting with kids in a blind to all, <laughs> all with the turn of one question. <laughs> It's like he knows how to light me up. <laughs> and no, we can bring it all back, though, to that one question and to hunting with your kids yes. and to re- hunter recruitment. Because if, we're, if, we're recru- if we are recruiting new hunters, yeah. we're recruiting new gun owners. Yep. We are recruiting people that are going to look at things just a little differently than the status quo, everyday citizen who's out there just going to work, doing their thing, coming home, and they're on the treadmill of yep. life, right? Yep. Which is easy to do. When you're a hunter, you're a little more in tuned with the natural rhythm of things. You're, li- you're, 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 you're probably vested in it. You're interested in it. It becomes a passion. And then that passion spills over into things like gun ownership, which spills over into things like gun rights, which spills over into the inherent right you have to protect yours yourself and others yep. you know i in the same country um about a year ago same just a was a little further away than you were excuse me we had a situation where we got on a, a wounded bear and i have never in my life wanted one of my handguns so badly as i did in that situation the cover was so thick that I don't think I could have deployed the rifle that was in my hands for anything other than to shove it in the bear's face. Yeah. And the bear was in the brush, popping, snapping, agitated with us, and we we were able to back out. But it was the next day in the daylight. I'm like, man, I really wish I had yep. a, a little shotgun, you know, a, a handgun, something. Something swingable. I had nothing. I had nothing. And I, I honestly, that was one of the few times that I felt like, holy smokes, I'm, I'm rolling, I'm rolling out of here naked. Yeah, that you was know? a good episode. That's on, uh, that's on your Wingman uh, mm-hmm. YouTube channel. Yep. Where yep. you guys shot, shot geese in the morning we, and yep. bears at hunted night. Geese in, hunted geese in the mornings and or waterfall in the mornings. We did shoot some ducks and then hunted bears in the evenings and it was a ton of fun. Yeah, I, it's, that's like, that, a, that's that was like a, one of those epic. That's a hunt adventures. that I would, yeah, if I could, you know, if like money was no object, I'd do that every fall. That's how I'd kick my fall off every year. Yeah. Because it was early, it was before like elk season gets rolling, before, that would be my early teal or my yeah. dove hunt. That's that's what I would go do, but yeah. phenomenal. But yeah, it, it all goes back into, we can roll this great big melee of a conversation that we just had back into, there's no such thing as too much hunter recruitment. Right. Yes, we're going to have to deal with crowded public lands. Yes, we're going to have to deal with getting along in the field with other with other folks. We see it here. Our little valley is grown by about six to eight thousand people, and it sh- <sighs> man, know. it shows. It shows when we're out. When I'm out scouting, I never used to see other rigs. Maybe one other guy. Like, hey, Bill, how's it yeah. going? You know, you guys going to hunt this field? Yeah, I'll go find another one. Now the competition's ramped up to the point to the point where. You get to a spot where you have permission to hunt, and there somebody else might have permission too. And if, if you don't beat them there, you're going to be competing with them. Yeah. And that leads into how do we diffuse that situation by being gracious with yeah. one another? Yeah. You know, it's like I have so many times shown up to a spot, and there's a guy and his kid there, and it's just me and one other buddy. It's like, hey, instead of setting up hundred yards apart, let's sit together. And then that leads into very candid conversations about gun safety and expectations. And watch my dogs, you know, my old dog especially. It's like he ain't, he's not steady. He's going to go when, you, when we shoot, those things. But it binds us more tightly as a community of hunters. Yeah. And it strengthens our voice, which allows more recruitment in the end. Yeah, rather than being, than being <clears throat> competitors, you know, on that same stretch or river or same field or whatever, just – Join them. Say, hey, why don't you guys join us? I, I got some cream pies and some <laughs> Juniper Mountain coffee. Let's do this. So, and join our coffee yeah, club. Exactly. Our little coffee club. Come on in. <laughs> and sometimes that's sometimes it's doable, sometimes it's not. You know, you got a big crew, they got a big crew. It's like, okay, yeah. how are we gonna figure this out? But man, I hear horror stories mm-hmm. all the time about mm-hmm. competition, competition, competition. And that has led into this 
introspective view of, you know, maybe we've done too good of a job at hunter recruitment. I don't think so. No, I I don't don't think think that's possible. I don't think it's possible because what we're trying to do is conserve the resource and how you do that for generations is get the generations involved. Well, I got news for you too. If you think we're doing too good of a job at recruiting hunters, Look at the number of hunters versus the number of, I don't know, let's just say TikTok users. Oh, gosh. That's not even fair. That's not even fair. But that's but true. But that's what we're dealing with. Yeah. That's that's what we're fighting. It's Our numbers are minuscule in comparison to pickleball players. Yeah. For example, those are huge numbers of people. I don't even know how you make a ball out of a pickle. I don't, I don't get either. it. It's wasted on me. But we called that tennis when I was a kid. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> Anyway, sorry to all you pickleball people out there. I just don't get it. Um, but that's but that's the point. We're a minuscule number, and we have to be loud. We have to be unified. We have to be all on the same page and growing. Otherwise, it's going to go away. We are literally a generation away from this. Yep. If you don't take your kids and teach your kids, if I don't do that with my kids, if you don't do that with your kids – it's gone. Yep. If you don't do that with somebody else's kids, you know, I don't have kids. Well, there's a massive fatherlessness epidemic in this country. Yep. And I'm talking to the guys here. If there's gals listening to this, you, you can take, you can mentor as well. But overwhelmingly, hunters are, are male. I yep. mean, if we just look at the numbers, it's, that's the facts. We need to be recruiting, yep. whether it's the neighbor's kid, a club, fathers in the field, your own kids – Whatever it might be, yep. you know, I think about some of the best hunts that I ever went on. They were with somebody else's dad, you know, and I'm not throwing my own dad under the bus. You guys have seen the last, the latest episode yeah. that's out now. I love my dad. We, I love hunting with him, but I had some hunts. I've had some hunts over the years where it was me and a buddy and his dad. Yeah. And it was so much fun. Yeah. Was a ton of you fun. know, I do a, I do a ton of on my podcast. I mine's different than this. My, I interview interesting people and find out who and where they came from. You're the, and ba- you're the Barbara Walters of big of hunting. I don't know what the, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but but Oprah? The, yeah Maybe? yeah that's it. <laughs> Is there a but, book under my seat? The, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> brand new car. <laughs> But the red thread that that I connect everybody is hunting, and the number one question is is why do you hunt? And of course, you find out who, you know where they started. And I would say overwhelmingly, most of the time, it's somebody else's dad or some some mentor, an uncle, an, a grandfather, you know, the neighbor guy, you know, the 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 one guy says, yeah, I just kept ending up in this guy's garage, my neighbor's garage, because he had all these heads and he would tell me a story about every single one of them. And pretty soon I was, I was in a duck blind with him. And then yep. pretty soon I'm in a tree stand with him and I learned how to hunt from him. He said, my dad didn't hunt and he didn't care that I was with this guy because he was a good guy. Make sure that that yeah, happens. But, yeah. but do your due diligence. But my dad didn't hunt. He was too busy working. He worked right. his butt off. He was working in a steel mill or whatever it was. Right. And and so, yeah, that happens a lot. Mm-hmm. Way more. Way more. I, I would say 50% of my guests didn't have parents that, yeah. that hunted. Yep. Didn't have an uncle. Didn't have a family member necessarily that took them hunting. It yeah. might have been Joe down the road. Right. I can, I can name dozens of yeah. influential men, people, but men mostly in my life that it was and it all revolved around the outdoors. That was yeah. what I was interested in, and you, I sought those people out. Yeah. So. Thank you. That was yeah. a fun conversation. Yeah. We went down a massive rabbit hole and got into all kinds of, of mm, powder keg conversations, <laughs> if you will. But that's that's okay. I think yeah. we need to have those conversations. And we need to be able to take a candid, just straight on look at questions like, are we doing too good of a job at, yeah. at recruiting hunters? I know for a fact there's some people out there that say, yeah, we are. I don't agree. Yeah. And for all the reasons that we talked about from birds of prey and ravens and predators and all this other big, huge loop. Well, we came out of the corn maze right where we started. Take your kids hunting. Yep. hundred percent. Well, I I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate, appreciate you saving the blind and uh, taking my kids. We're working on it again. I don't have, I don't have duck uh, or bird dogs. And uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to do that. It's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, my kids absolutely in uh, adore you they look at you as mr helms which i i now call him tell, call him mr todd because he loves that <laughs> but um it's a lot of fun and yeah. i appreciate it yep. get out there do it 
we're in the thick of it. Yeah, we are. And, and everybody around the country for the most part has some sort of small game or bird hunting left to do throughout the winter, whether it's upland, whether it's waterfowl, whatever it might be, get your kids out, do it in a group, make it fun, yep. take the snacks, take the hot chocolate, have a good time. Yep. And yeah, there's going to be lots of times where you and the, you and your hunting cronies can get out and really get after it hardcore, but there's plenty of time for you to dial it back and just yep. go back and, and have a good time and introduce somebody to it as well. That's right. Thank you for being on. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Wingman Podcast, guys. We have explored a wide range of topics, most importantly talking about hunter recruitment and how that sets up everything that we do as hunters from conservation to gun ownership and hot button topics like predator reintroduction and even um, anti-2A or anti-Second Amendment sentiments and legislation that's on the books. Remember, make sure that you're getting people involved in hunting, taking somebody that maybe necessarily wouldn't go. Ike and I dove into a wealth of topics around this, but it all centers back on hunter recruitment, taking kids hunting, taking new folks hunting, and getting out and enjoying the outdoors. So until next time, thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the field.